this morning, <clears throat> we're continuing on with authority. And I think authority is probably one of the, the least understood and in our generation, the least respected concepts out of the Word of God. Um, and it has really hurt us moving spiritually the way that we need to. Now, if you've ever been in the military, you do understand authority. And I want to start with that in Matthew chapter 8 this morning, starting with verses 5 through 10. Matthew 8, verses 5 through 10, and this is about the centurion that came to Jesus that had a servant that needed to be healed. As Jesus went into Capernaum, a centurion came to, up to him, begging him and saying, Lord, my servant boy is lying at the house paralyzed and distressed in intense pain. And I'm reading this out of the Amplified Bible. And Jesus said unto him, I will come and restore him. But the centurion replied to him, Lord, I am not worthy or fit to have you come under my roof, but only speak the word, and my servant boy will be cured. For I also am a man subject to authority, when soldiers, uh, and, and with soldiers subjected to me. And I say to one, go, and he goes, and to another, come, and he comes, and to my slave, do this, and he does it. When Jesus heard him, he marveled and said to those that followed him who adhered steadfastly to him, conforming to his example in living and if need be in dying also, I, tru I, tr uh, I tell you truly, I have not found so much faith as with anyone even in Israel. Now what's interesting, this guy was a Gentile. He had not been trained on the covenant that, that the Jewish people had with God. He had not been trained to that. He did not understand covenant, but he understood authority. And let me, let me, let me can, I, can I kind of put this in, in a way that you would understand? We're always, in, you know, in, in, in Christianity, it's like if we could only understand covenant and really get, uh, get our, our head around covenant, we could walk in so much more of God. This man's understanding and authority and respect for it closed the gap of what he did not understand in covenant. So much so that Jesus looked at him and said, I have not found anyone of this great of faith in all of Israel, all the people that have been taught covenant their whole life, that have been taught about the miracles that happened throughout all the Tanakh, from the very time that they were able to understand language, they were taught that they were in blood covenant with God and taught their responsibilities and the benefits of walking in covenant. None of them had the faith that this man had. So I think one of the things that we can draw from this, the key to having great faith is having a, an understanding and a deep respect for authority. And we're going to see this morning that uh, this generation doesn't have it. In fact, everything about our culture is just the opposite. Understanding and respecting authority is the key to greater faith in our lives. Now, there's two types of authority. Legitimate authority and illegitimate authority. Can you really tell the difference? Can we tell the difference anymore? Legitimate authority is always delegated authority from a greater source. In other words, you have to be under a greater legitimate authority to function in legitimate authority. Okay? Legitimate authority always has the best interest of all involved in mind and knows that it must answer to a greater authority that is righteous and just. There is always a sense that it, that it enforces the right thing in any situation. If I have been charged with the care of of something, and I've got to answer to a higher authority for that care, I always put the best interests of whatever I've been placed in authority over. Illegitimate authority is always stolen or usurped authority. 
uh, such as an individual, this such an individual is usually not under authority unless it's an, ag- an agent of a greater illegitimate authority. Illegitimate authority uses intimidation and fear to enforce its authority over people or over circumstances. It is quick to ridicule or attack anything that might question its actions or its ideas. In reality, God is the source of all legitimate authority. Lucifer is the source of all illegitimate authority. The reason he had authority in the earth is he tricked Adam into giving him his. But can we look back just, if you look in America, there was a time that Americans moved in legitimate authority. We understood it. I watched a clip this week from uh, It's a Wonderful Life, and the kids are getting ready to go to the prom, and how many know that a father is legitimate authority over his family? He was given that responsibility from God. And so they're talking about, you know, we're going to go out and we're going to drink and have a good time, and he said, no gin tonight. Oh, Dad, not a drop. And that's all it took. He was moving in authority and that authority was respected. A police officer would say, don't do this. That was enough. A teacher would say, these are the rules of my classroom. Well, that was the way it was. A minister, when he got up behind the pulpit, he feared God with reverential fear, and he understood the authority of God and the authority of God's word. But something happened. And the 60s was a pivotal time in American history. We moved from a people that understood authority to a people that rebelled against everything. The 60s used three mechanisms. The occult used three mechanisms. They used the occult. And I mean, if you look back in the 60s, and, and even today you can go to some of our universities and they have... They have, now they have reframed it. Back then they actually called it occultic studies. Now they frame it as, as business or whatever. And there, there, there are and, and, and several universities, especially out in California, if they have women's studies in business, they'll actually teach them how to use occult and witchcraft to climb the corporate ladder. So you have that going on. It was a drug revolution. And the drugs are always a gateway to the occult, to the spirit realm. And it was a sexual revolution. Let's throw off the constraints. And so it was all about uh, moving away from legitimate authority. Police went from being police officers to pigs, didn't they? And what's interesting, I'm reading a book called America Light by a professor from Yale. And uh, from everything he writes about, he's, he's either Jewish or a believer, one or the other. And he, he always has great reverence for the church and, with our, and uh, within the synagogue. And he said that that time, he said, prior to that revolution, we were a Judeo-Christian nation. And the, one of the terms that he, that, that, he, that he coined really captured my attention. He says, we don't understand today that we are a scientific pagan nation. And that was a byproduct of the establishing of illegitimate authority. That when I look back at the 60s, we had two things going on. We had those that Satan pushed so far into darkness, he pushed them over into God. We had the Jesus movement and a lot of different things. We had revival out of that. But we had a lot of them that did not do that, and they became the professors in the universities. In fact, a lot of that came out of the university to begin with. And it moves an illegitimate authority, and that illegitimate authority will derail, come against, try to embarrass anything immediately. You see, legitimate authority, it has the potential of having power. There's two different words in the Greek. There is exousia, which means the authority, and then there is deutimus, miracle working power. And how many know they're different? An officer has authority to move but if you, if you refuse to yield to that authority, then he can back it up with power that's been granted to him. Illegitimate authority always starts out with the power first. They, they will attack you to establish their authority. 
That's why so many times on, on television, when you see, you see, let's say, two senators, one's moving in authority, one's moving in illegitimate authority, one wants to reason, wants to debate and look at all the facts. The other one starts out by attacking the other man. Anybody ever seen that? Or, or they have an agenda, and so they create a war. Well, there's a war on women. There's a war on this. There's a war on that. There's no really war. And, and their, their initial response is, you're a hate monger. You're this. You're that. You're that phobic <laughs> Whatever the, the case may be. And they immediately attack because if you examine and use logic, you understand that they have no legitimate authority about what they're doing. And so they, they try to gather power to enforce an illegitimate authority. That's what Satan does all the times in our life. He attacks so that he can try to undermine our authority and use illegitimate authority over us. Now, can, can, he, can, he, can you kind of tell the difference between authority and illegitimate authority? I mean, in the military, you, you had a clear chain of command. Now, if I was commissioned by an officer to do something and a lesser officer not in that chain of command would try to get me to do something else, even though he had authority that was, in a sense, illegitimate authority because it didn't fit within the chain of command. And I could, I could, I could tell that officer, even though I was enlisted, I can't do that because I have, my authority has instructed me to do this. Now, once I do this, we can see if he will allow me to do that. Otherwise, it's an illegitimate order. You're not getting this. You're going to get it. I'm a man under authority of God, and I am functioning the way that I'm supposed to. Satan comes along and tries to bring me under another authority. If I'm totally submitted to a man under authority, I can tell him no. Now, he may try to bash me. He may try to ridicule me. He may try to do a lot of things to exude power to bring me under control. But if I choose not to yield to that and choose to be a man under authority, he can't gain authority in that situation. The only way he can gain it is the same way he got it in the garden. I've got to give it to him. This is going to click in a minute. We also need to look at respecting authority. I want to turn to John chapter 5 and verse 30. We've got to understand that illegitimate authority doesn't want to respect authority. It never does. It'll come against it because it has to try to supplant it. Every time, if, when you start walking with God, Satan is going to come to you and he's going to try to get you out of God's authority because you have to, to function in the earth, you have to be under authority, either under his authority or under God's. But I want you to look at, at Jesus' attitude here in John chapter 5, verse 30. I can of mine own self do nothing as I hear, I judge, and my judgment is just because I seek not mine own will, but the will of the Father which has sent me. Jesus was completely a man under authority. He was completely under the authority of the Father. Because of that, he could tell the storm, peace be still, because the Father said, this is an illegitimate storm. Yeah. That's right? right? Absolutely. You arrest the storm. Yeah. Why was it that he would walk into some places, heal some and not others? Because the Father said, this is an illegal sickness. This, this is something that does not fit under my authority. Or sometimes he couldn't heal like in Nazareth because they didn't recognize his authority. Now, he called it unbelief. There are, the Bible's very clear. There he could do no mighty works because of unbelief. Because they couldn't see, you know, that kid was raised here. But they couldn't see who he was under the authority of. And if you can't see who someone is under the authority of, you can't tap into that authority. Right. 
Jesus did more than just miracles. Now let's look at Matthew chapter 7, verse 28 and 29. I'm, I'm trying to establish some things for you. You guys need to get to the place to where when someone's teaching, you can tell whether they're under godly authority or under illegitimate authority. Because right now, most pulpits are not under godly authority. Because they don't respect the authority of God, nor do they respect the authority of his word. Because if they respected the authority of this word, this word tells me how I'm supposed to be. If I don't have respect for it, I begin usurping the authority of that word and taking snippets and sound bites here to make it say what I want it to say. If I'm doing that, I have no respect for this word, nor do I have respect for God. I am using it as a platform to use illegitimate authority, and I'm corrupting the word of God. Now, in, in verse uh, in, in Matthew 20, in 7, 28, and 29, and it came to pass when Jesus had ended these things, the people were astounded at his doctrine, for he taught them as one having authority and not as the scribes. He could tell them the mind of God, and they understood that he, was, he, he, he wasn't trying to jockey for position. You see that through all the, all the Gospels. The Pharisees are trying to set up the Sadducees, and they're worried about public opinion. Jesus never worried about public opinion. He worried about the opinion of the Father. I mean, when, 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 you, when you have the religious leaders of the community coming in, and he greets them by saying, snakes and vipers. Guys, if you don't, if your righteousness isn't better than theirs, you can't even get into heaven. I mean, how many know that he's not worried about public opinion? All he was worried about was, my father has sent me to do this. I am yielded to godly authority. What you're trying to do, because there's another kind of authority. There's godly authority. Now, in democracy, our senators and Republicans are supposed to, our senators and, Demo, and, uh, and uh, congressmen and even the president is supposed to draw their authority from the people. We vote them into office and they draw the authority by what they're supposed to represent us. And so constitutionally, they draw it from the people. Well, somehow or another, they had a, a, a portion of that in the times of Jesus. The people didn't draw their authority. The leaders didn't draw their authority from God. They were drawing it from the amount of people they, they could get to follow and to finance what they were doing. Yeah. Kind of like a lot of Christian yeah. ministries today. Right. And we validate illegitimate authority by the amount of money they have, or by the way they twist Scripture to please what we want to hear. That's right. Let me tell you something. There's a lot in the Word of God I don't want to hear. At least my flesh doesn't want to hear. Because it looks at those places in my life and says, you've got to crucify that. If you're going to come under divine authority, these things must be crucified. These things are going to have to be made alive in your life. And these things are going to have to die if you're really going to walk with God. If you're going to, come, if you're going to be a man under authority, you're going to have to succumb to that authority. And when a man does that or a woman does that and they begin to share from the word that way, there, there is an authoritative, there, they don't have to use intimidation or appealing to the flesh or manipulation to get it done. How many of us here lately, when you watch Christian TV, there, there are some really good preachers on Christian TV, but there are also some others, you feel like you're watching infomercials. Because it's, and we, we've, got, we've got Gnostic because they finance their ministries by manipulating people. Now, if you give to, you know, if you give to this ministry, God's going to do this. And you're going to have two angels. No, well, you know what? Well, I, I've heard from God and I have, I have this uh, Psalms 95 word that so many people are going to give $95. You knew this guy's going to lose 10 angels. I can't find that anywhere in the word of God. But illegitimate authority will move that way to finance itself. And if you get enough people doing it, we think, well, that's a big ministry. They really are hearing from God, and it's, it's proof of their divine authority. But yet Jesus said, you know, uh, I don't even have a place to lay my head. How about in the book of Acts, silver and gold have I none, but that which I give unto you. Get up, rise up, and walk. And I remember, sir, um, I think it was Sir Francis of Assisi, uh, or 
uh, Francis of Assisi, who, if, if I'm remembering the, I don't have notes on this one, but I think it was uh, Francis of Assisi, he, he actually got to meet with the Pope, and the Pope was showing him all the riches of the Vatican. And the Pope says, you know, we can't say silver and gold have we none. And uh, this man of God's response was, neither can we say in the name of Jesus, rise up and walk. Even, even in the midst of being caught up within the Catholic Church, he understood spiritual authority. Since the 60s within our culture, preachers no longer respect the authority of God's word or God's authority anymore. If they did, they would be doing things a whole lot different. We have become just as political as Washington, D.C. is political. There's all this manipulation and promises that are never met, and, and some go the other way, pronouncing doom if you don't. All these different things to manipulate the people. Parents' authority is no longer respected in the home. You know, you can go back to that, it's a wonderful life. All Dad had to say was, no, you're not going to do that, not a drop, and they didn't do it. To where these days, guys, we have teachers moving in illegitimate authority that manu use manipulation and an agenda that they are now teaching the kids, don't listen to mom and dad. Mom and dad aren't smart enough to know what's going on. And sometimes that bleeds over. Uh, have, you, have you seen this one on TV? The guy's getting ready to dig a post hole to put his, his mailbox. And the little girl is talking dad out of it because you need to call dig right first. What they don't understand is you have just totally destroyed the authority of that father by doing that. If he was truly moving in authority, he would have known he didn't have to dig it. But what it's, the, the subtextual context there is Parents are stupid, don't listen to them, you already know better, because you know how to move in the system. And they do it over and over again in the school systems. The kids don't listen to their parents, and how many know that it makes the age of accountability when they hit 13 very difficult? Because they go through an age where they have no learning, and then now that they're accountable, now we consider 13 not the age of entering into accountability, we consider it the age of rebellion, where the rebellion starts, and you hope they survive until 1821, where finally their head begins to re-engage. Re <clears throat> That's culturally put up. Police officers no longer are respected. They're, they went from being officers to pigs, or the po-po. And to be truthful, most in, in politics... They're, they're moving in illegitimate authority because they're no longer answerable to the people. There's other people on the outside pulling the strings. And what they do is they promise you things they can never deliver on. Or they say, you know, if you like the other guy, you're going to be eating cat food the rest of your life because he's going to destroy this. They use fear and intimidation. All of that's illegitimate authority. Someone moving in real authority says, these are the facts. Let's go ahead and look at this. And if you can show me a better way of doing it that is logical, that you can pull empirical evidence that this works better than what I want to do, I will yield to it. Instead, all there is is bashing and yelling and screaming. And you have two ideologies that never want to be hindered by the facts at all. That's because it has moved out of the realm of authority. Authority always moves with facts. It moves with that which is real, that which is concrete. And how many know really the kingdom of God is really concrete? Yeah, sure is. In fact, what is awesome when you understand authority is the healing that is available in the kingdom is a greater reality than the sickness that's working in your body. The creativity that God can work through you is greater than the poverty coming against you. Absolutely. But the only way to activate it is you've got to respect God's authority and yield to his authority. Right. Most preachers, now I'm, I'm talking from a white Anglo-Saxon perspective. We have become so democratic. 
we, we have moved the, the concept of democracy from the government into the church to where, you know, the preachers are elected. They're not called of God. They're elected. And therefore, if the, if the power is drawn from the people and not from God, that authority, he can only move in the authority of the people. How many of the authority of people isn't going to get you healed when you need it? And so instead of walking all the time pleasing God, the, 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 today's pastor walks around pleasing the people. Now, I, I want you to try to, because I'm, I'm going to share a story with you. I want you to see if you can put this in context if this would work in a white church. Now, some of the things I'm sharing aren't universalism. Some of you know that all white churches aren't this way or all black churches aren't this way. But in uh, the black churches that I go and I teach at, they understand authority and they respect their bishops, they respect their pastors. In fact, one of our professors, uh, Dr. Young, was teaching at San Jose Christian College in, uh, in California. He was a, a, an adjunct professor that would come in and teach. And, you know, Dr. Young, you know, so, you know for, for us normal white folk, you know, having letters behind your name adds credibility. The black students were ignoring him. He's the one teaching the class that's the expert, and they're ignoring him. And all of a sudden, one of them said, hey, 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 hey. You listen to Pastor Young. Pastor had greater weight than Ph.D. Because they understood authority. And he said, from that moment on, once they found out I was a pastor and not just a professor, he said, they, they, they were diligent in their studies that I didn't have to get them to, to corral them when it was time to lecture. It was like, shh, shh, pastor's talking. You don't see that in a lot of white churches. And I, I was talking with, with uh, Bishop Nod down in Atlanta. Now, see if this would work in a white church, okay? He, 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 uh, the, the man's very prophetic. He really understands how to walk with God, and he hears God, and he knows the difference when it's him and it's God. And sometimes that's a rarity. Some guys, you know, they're starting to, they don't really know which one is which. This girl comes in, and she just got out of a very abusive relationship. And she's only been going to the church for four months. Bishop, I, I, I really want God to turn my life around. I, I surrender to God. What do I need to do? Well, he knows that she just came out of abusive relationships, so she probably has problems with her dad. Okay? So he's in Atlanta. You know, they're sitting in Atlanta. He said, here's a list of ten things you need to do. The very first one is get on a plane and fly to Los Angeles and find your father and fall, and fall at his feet and say, we need to get this relationship right. Now, how many know in a white church that would have stopped right there? It's time to go ahead and vote that bishop out. He doesn't know what he's talking about. The girl gets on a plane, flies to Los Angeles, does exactly what the bishop tells her, comes back and says, okay, what are the next points? And he took her right down the line, point by point by point. And she says, now, I've, I've adjusted what I want from God because I really, I, I feel God wants me to live in California, and I, I, I like to have a godly husband. And he starts telling her exactly the things that she needs to do. At the end of a year, 12 months, she has a job in California managing tripling her salary, that which she was really believing God for. And in the process, he says, you need to go back and talk to your dad again and just build that relationship. She flies back out to Los Angeles. She's eating dinner with her husband, and this very attractive young black man walks up to her and says, I'd like to get to know you better. And he said, now stop right there. He said, I'm not a player. I'm, I'm not wanting a good time. He said, I walk with God, and I have been believing God for a godly wife. I'm looking for a wife, not a good time. And as I was sitting there, the Holy Ghost told me that you're the woman that I need to build a relationship with. So at the end of this year, she's getting ready to move to California. She's saying goodbye to her bishop with a new job, and she's engaged and going to be married a day or two after she gets to California. All this transpired within a year because they respected authority. And, and I, I, I've seen Sister Ruth grab a hold of some of the young people almost by the ear and said, you know what? You're going to start changing things. You're going to start changing things right now. You know, you, and I mean, some, I mean, I've seen her just about do it to, to a young black man that I'm thinking, you know what? He could take us both on and we'd both be really hurting right now because, I mean, this guy never, never had a problem not going to the weight room, okay? 
And, and he's sitting there, and he's yielding because he understands the love and the authority that's there. And he's saying, yes, ma'am, I'll fix that. Yes, ma'am, you'll never see it again. Yes, ma'am. And we wonder why in some areas within like the black church that they're accelerating at such a rate, that there's greater miracles there. there there's greater financial turnover there. With, but you can also see a section of the black church that don't understand authority. They're not experiencing that. So it's not just cultural. It's not because of their ethnic background. It's because they have tapped into that. And I can go to some white churches too that do the same thing. Or how many know when, when, a, when a husband or wife get a hold of God and begin moving in authority, it can change a household dramatically? I remember a story. And this guy was saying, listen, my, my, my son's out of control. I don't know what to do. And I think it was Dr. John Gar that was ministering to him, if I remember right. And, and he discovered the Sabbath. And, and John basically was saying, listen, you start, need to start moving in your authority. Ev Shabbat, you have authority from God to teach your household to lay hands on your children and to speak the blessing over them and to do all these things. And so the dad would, on Ev Shabbat, he would learn to move in the authority given to him by God. That, that's, a, that's a male headship right. That he would do that and he would pray over his kids. And see, I got, I got the story on the latter end because he's telling you, he said, remember 10 years ago, Dr. Gar, when you told me to do this, that, and the other? He said, my son is now getting ready to go to college. He's got scholarship to go to college. And, and I, he had to leave out very early Saturday morning, and he was late packing up Saturday night or Sunday, Friday night where he couldn't do Ev Shabbat. And he said, Five o'clock this morning, my son woke me up and said, Daddy, I can't go to college until you lay your hands on me and pray over me. Authority. We so jip ourselves by not learning to move in the authority that God has given us. But here's the question that we got to ask ourselves. How do I get there? How do I get to moving in that authority? And I want to share one other story with you right from the Word of God. Can I do that? Let's go to Jude. Jude chapter 1. Of course, there's only one chapter in Jude, verses 8 and 9. And this deals with spiritual warfare. You have to respect authority on both sides of the aisle. If you underestimate Lucifer's authority you're going to get your lunch eat. Now, I, I want to I'll set this in, in context. Now, Jude is sharing some things about the last days. It says, Likewise, also these filthy dreamers defile the flesh, despise dominion, and speak evil of dignitaries. And then he contrasts that, Yet Michael, the archangel, who contended with the devil he disputed about the body of Moses, durst not bring against him a railing accusation but said, the Lord rebuke thee. Okay, let's set this back into context. Michael is the archangel that when Lucifer fell, drove him out of heaven. So he's entering into this situation a victor. It's like, I took you down, Jack. You see, where you were saying, I will be like the Most High God. I got my name. My name means who is like the Most High God. And I kind of wonder if he got that after his response to Lucifer. When Lucifer said, I will, I will, I will, Michael said, who do you think you are? That's what Mikhail means, who is like the Most High God. So he's the one who drove him out. And now Lucifer has authority in the earth again because he he was given that authority when man when man committed high treason against God. So there's, there's an, an aspect of legitimate and unlegitimate authority with that. And so now he's facing over the body of Moses. How many know that he could have got up in his face and said, you know what, I've took you down before, I'm going to take you down again, blah, 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 all this trash talk. Did you ever see kids on a, on a playground talking trash talk? I see that a lot in spiritual warfare, people trying to trash talk the devil. You don't trash talk the devil. The only way that you can move truly in authority is you have got to respect God's authority, and you've got to respect that authority, knowing that only this authority can overcome that authority. 
I've seen too many people try to trash talk the devil in spiritual warfare, and within a year their lives are destroyed. You had no respect for God's authority. Somebody taught you on spiritual authority, and you thought you could do it in the flesh, that you could do it in your carnality, that it was like a, a, a street fight or something. And even, because he, look, he, he says this in context, how these people moving in the flesh, they despise dominion, they despise authority, and they, they speak evil of dignitaries that move in authority, call them police pigs or whatever. And he said, listen, once you learn from the, from the archangel Michael that when he was contesting over the body of Moses, he stood completely under divine authority, and he says, I'm here because the Lord's rebuking you. If you respect authority, you respect authority on both sides of the aisle. Because everything spiritually is, works on a legal premise. We talk about legalism. Satan is the absolute legalist of all. He has to have a loophole to get into your life. He's got to get you to do this so that he can go to God and say, I have a legal, that's what the accuser of the brethren is. He's a prosecuting attorney. I can bring them into captivity because they have done this, they have done that, they have done this. He's a legalist. Because while he's telling us not to respect authority, he absolutely respects authority and moves within those legal realms. Knowing that if he can get me to disrespect God's authority, by default, I come under his. Come on. And so we have, got to, we have got to learn to respect, and I'm not talking about respecting the preacher. Guys, if it, you get, and, and those who have been around me, you know that there are times that Mike Lake has an idea, then there's times I hear prophetically. And there's a difference. There's a difference about my countenance. There's a difference there. And they have learned it. And, and so when I have an idea, weigh it out. But when I've actually heard from God, and, and it's like when Jesus, when he taught with authority, when you can hear God in my voice, listen. When you can't, ponder. Weigh. Go back to Scripture. I'm not talking about respecting this. I'm talking about... It is it had had a household if you respect God the way you should and reverence him and respect him, it's gonna put you in a position to exercise authority in your own household. If you're exercising authority in your own household, right, you can go on the job and you have delegated authority at that job to do things, you can move in that authority. When we surrender to that, when we surrender to God, then I'm in a position where I can tell, tell the devil, the Lord is rebuking you against what you're trying to do in my life. You will not get me in the flesh to have a legal right to bring me under your authority. I choose to be in the authority of God. I move in what this word says. I move in what God has said. Now, it doesn't matter if I understand it or not. You know, a lot of times, and I, I guess being in the military has served me well. Now, I was an idiot when I was in the military. I was young, and there was water running off the back of my ears that looked like a waterfall. Uh, I was rebellious. I'll be, be truthful. I was young. I went in the military when I was 18. I got here a few years ago. I got to, I got to sit down by a colonel in the Army. And I don't, I, I, if I remember, I think he was Special Forces by his patches and stuff, and I got to sit down by him. And I said, sir, I want to thank you. Now, I didn't get to do this when I was a kid in the military, but the disciplines and the things I was taught in the military that I never did when I was on active duty, I'm doing now, and they really serve me well. But I learned, I, 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 one, one of my positions, I was driving around a Fulberg Colonel, and we were on maneuvers and doing different things, and so you kind of try to plan out you know, what you're doing to get ready and everything. And so I was asking him about the schedule and all that he needed to do the next day. And he said, Lake, you don't need to know. You just need to have the car full of gas or the Jeep full of gas and the Jeep ready with the, with the, the equipment that you're supposed to have. But the rest of it, you don't have a need to know right now. But I understood that authority. I said, okay, you, know, you just point me in the right direction when I get there. I don't know where I'm going to go. Don't know exactly how we're going to get there. I'm going to drive until you say stop, 
and I'll know why we're there. How many times in life is God taking you down a journey that all he said was, pick up your Bible, pick up your authority, we're going for a walk, and you don't know really where you're going to go, you don't know exactly where the enemy is behind the lines or anything else, and God says, trust me and respect my authority, and if you yield to it, when we get to the finish line, there's going to be victory. I couldn't, I don't understand warfare the way that that colonel did. He understood strategic warfare. And these were war games. Now, he could spend six hours trying to get me to comprehend why we're going to drive and why the troops are doing this, that, or the other. Or he could say, get behind the wheel. And, I, and he could point me and say, you drive, you stop, you take me here, you take me there. And a lot of times that's the way with God. God operates. How I many know at a higher intellect that we do? Aren't you glad? Aren't you glad? You see, the devil's playing checkers and God's playing three-dimensional chess. And so God's having me down a road. Not, and I mean, it may be a bumpy road. It may be full of potholes. It may be scary at the time. But the psalmist say, Yo, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Because when I get on the other end of it, thou preparest a table before me. And the devil's got to sit and watch. But, you see, the Lord is my shepherd. I respect the shepherd's authority, the almighty God, and wherever he leads me and I go down that road, I trust in him. I trust in his wisdom, even though I may not understand it at the time. If he says, go to the right, I go to the right. I don't know what's around the corner, but he does because he's already there. One of the prayers that I pray in spiritual warfare is, God, you fill all time and space. Please go before me and prepare the way. Trip up the devil before I get there. Isn't that what it means when the snare is going to fall into his own traps? The, the fowler's going to fall into his own snares? Go ahead and let the devil trip into the very thing he set for me because my, my steps are ordered by you because I respect your authority. This word has become a light into my path and a lamp into my feet. I may not understand right now why you say I can't do this. Come on. But, Mommy, they, they make the Drano can look so attractive. I bet it tastes wonderful. No. See? There's skull and crossbones on the back. Don't even touch it. We can't mean that may not be able to comprehend what's going on. I don't understand why he tells me maybe to do certain things. I don't understand why he may tell me not to do certain things. I've always wondered why bacon tastes so wonderful. You know, if God said not to eat it, maybe it ought to taste like, you know, cow dung or something, but it don't. Why? Because he's trying to teach me things of sin may taste good, but they'll kill you in the long run. That's right. If every time you sin, you know, you know how you could end all sin on earth? The very second you do it, you drop dead. Right. People quit. <laughs> Either that or run out of people, one or the other. But it's this elongation of it looks like you get away with it that makes it so attractive. But on the other hand, sometimes God's telling me to do something, and I don't see anything in the immediate because God's after something in the long run. When I respect authority and respect God's authority in my life, it begins to change the way that I move, the way, the, the, the way that I carry myself. It adjusts my attitude. And for some of us, it scales it down because some of us really think that we're, you know, ever met somebody that's like, you know, the whole earth should be privileged that I'm on it? And I'm really, and, and really I think your purpose in the earth is to, to get us to burn up a lot of flesh and to crucify and realize that we've got to. But then a lot of us don't thank enough of ourselves to really move in authority. And you can take somebody very timid that would not that would never thought, they begin to find out who they are in God and really submit to God, and you'll find out that they are a barracuda in spiritual warfare because they really find out who they were and how the devil was pressing them down. 
You may be a little scrawny kid on the backside of a pasture, but you can end up being a king if you submit to God. You see, David wasn't the biggest. David, David wasn't necessarily the bravest, but he's one who understood authority and understood covenant. And a little scrawny kid took down a giant when all the, all the big men hid in foxholes. But see, if you understand authority, if you really understand authority, size doesn't matter. Was Jesus' physical form big enough to stop a storm? You're always bigger on the inside than you are on the outside when you walk with God, when you understand authority. You don't assume anything. You know, there's been times, God, I've prayed for people to be healed. And uh, there, there have been a few times God said, well, just, just pray that I comfort them. Why? It ain't going to happen. <laughs> you know, and, and, you know if, if the good heart nature, I, I wish that everybody I prayed for got healed. I'd love to be able to go out and to clear a hospital. I mean, pull them right up off the operating table. Just put the heart back in and just watch it seal up, you know, and say, Jesus is real. How many know they get people's attention? But you know what? Unless God says to do it, it's not going to get done. That's why Jesus was able to walk by the pool of Bethesda, touch and minister to one guy, and left hundreds and hundreds there. Just one. Why? Because the Father said, this one. And because he was a man under authority... He went and did what the authority said. But you don't get to do that if you're not yielding to that authority in your day in and day out life. The little things build up to the big things. Just like the sin in your life didn't start out with a big thing, it always started out with a little thing. Now here's some steps that you can take to begin developing greater authority, thus greater faith in your life. Absolute surrender to God. That was implied in the very language of the gospel. If you will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, you'll be saved. May I submit that we have a lot of people going to church that aren't saved because they've never made Jesus Lord. They wanted him to be their fire insurance salesman, they're not saved. Absolute surrender equals absolute deliverance. You see, in the mechanism in which we, we have within us the fight or flight syndrome, you know, try to fight the devil on your own or flee from him, there's a third option because of Jesus. I can surrender to the one who beat the devil. Absolute surrender to God. Number two, absolute surrender to God's word. Quit arguing with that book and start doing what it says to do. And if your flesh doesn't like it, that's probably really a sign to you that you're actually reading what's in the book. Now that also requires you to take the time that you clearly understand what's there, that you've done your research. Don't take things out of, out of context. I am sick and tired of hearing preachers taking a soundbite here and a soundbite here and a soundbite here, and they use no hermeneutical process, no logic at all, and then here's the revelation. That's right up there with Judas went out and hung himself, go thou and do likewise, and what thou doest, do as quickly. It, it, it's, it's tantamount to manipulating Scripture. Go into clearly what God says in his word. If, guys, I mean, this is simple. If God is unchangeable, keep the Sabbath to keep it holy. That's unchangeable. That predates the Ten Commandments. That predates Moses. That goes back to creation. If God said don't eat pig, just don't eat it. You want to have a loving relationship and have, have a wife that loves you? Don't commit adultery. You want to have people that believe you? Don't lie. Come on. 
but but Mike, lying got me through in the past because you don't know the situations I got out of by lying. Yeah, but your flesh got you into them. So sin got you there and sin got you out, but it really didn't get you out. It not only destroyed your reputation on the earth, it de- and it destroyed your reputation in heaven, it destroyed your reputation with yourself. You know why the righteous can be as bold as a lion? They know they're doing the right thing. Yes. yes. And why the wicked run when no man chases? They already know what they're doing is wrong. And they're always looking over the shoulder. If you do what God's word says, you have confidence in God. First John says, if I keep his commandments, I have confidence with God, and I know that what I ask he hears of me because I'm constantly tuning into his station and obeying him. Absolute surrender to God's word. I'm tired of hearing preachers explain away God's word. What they don't realize is they're explaining away the kingdom. We want to go from kingdom state to welfare state. How many know kingdoms better? Number three, discipline yourself to respect legitimate authority. Here a few years ago, I, when they were working on I-44, I did something stupid. Can I tell on myself? I got a four-wheel drive truck, and we're parked, and there's a movie I'm wanting to go see. And there's just a clear shot to the side road. I pop it into four-wheel drive because thousands already had. I mean, there was a trail, okay? I get up on there, start going my merry way. Pulled myself over. The cop said, did you do that? Yes, sir, I did. Would you have done it if you were known that I was there? Probably not. And thank you for pulling me over. And Mary's saying, you know, we pray for you guys every day that you see stuff like this. (laughs) 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 He saw our attitude and our respect for him. I didn't get a ticket. I just got a warning. Because it was probably in staunch contrast to a a consumer chewing him out for doing his job. But see, when you if I if you in day in and day out respect legitimate authority, the legitimate authority of God, the legitimate authority around you, then your heart's going to respect you when you begin moving in legitimate authority. Four. Become a person under authority to God. This is a daily surrender to him. God, what's my marching orders for today? Now, how many of us have asked that and he has told us nothing? Okay. You got your kids going to go out and play in the backyard. You have, you have already told them, stay in the fence. How many know that you don't have to give them any special instructions for the day when they go out in the backyard? They already have them. And you already know that they're going to keep them, so there's no special instructions. Sometimes when God doesn't speak to us, it's because we have already respected his authority. He has already viewed everything that we're going to do that day. And he says, it's fine, just go out and play. And the devil beats us up. You didn't hear from God. You can't hear from God. How about you heard enough from God that he doesn't have to give you special instruction to keep you from doing stupid things that's going to get you hurt that day? That's actually sign of growth, not sign of spiritual immaturity. But daily, I choose to be under his authority. So when I walk into a situation... I literally try to center myself and what does God want in this situation? What, what does God want done today? I'm beginning to do that more even with ministry because I mean, the, I, I, administration with, with the seminary can actually wear a man to death. And sometimes I can have people call and in three minutes give me enough to do that it takes me three days. Michael knows what I'm talking about because he used to work for me. Oh, Dr. Lake, could you change this? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Three days later, I'm getting it fixed. It's real easy to do, but what I have found is if I, if I, I choose, God, what do you want me to do today? 
And he says, well, today, instead of doing admin, I want you just to sit and listen to me and write. And so when they call, I said, well, you know, it'll be tomorrow before I can start getting to that. Why? Because I chose to come under authority. Because I chose to come under authority, it allowed me to move in authority to say no to this or defer this so that I could be obedient with this today. That's part of being under authority. Five, consciously choose to move in God's delegated authority in your life. Not only to surrender to him, but when you do things, choose as, a, as an act of your conscious will to begin moving in what he's told you to do because you're moving in authority. You don't get to say, peace be still and have a storm stop when you have never moved an authority in anything in your life. It'll never work. You got to start up with the little things of moving in that authority. And sometimes, even, guys, I mean, you can move an authority on your diet. You can move an authority in a lot of different ways. I used to more resemble, did you ever see the commercial where the woman and there's a, a cake with a bear sheriff on it and she's bad mouth in the, 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 the cake and I bet you don't taste good and by the way you're really not a sheriff he's made of icing <laughs> she could she had to bad mouth the thing to try to convince herself that it was bad instead of moving in the authority that I don't have to have that I choose to say no once you learn how to move in authority the first line of authority is what self control if I can control self and submit self to God, I make the day a whole lot harder on the devil. Once I get that down, then I can move in situations within my household. I don't have to scream. I don't have to yell. I don't have to manipulate. I don't have to shame. I just simply move in authority. Because by us doing that, then we start teaching those around us how to recognize real authority. Instead of getting used to being manipulated to get to do stuff. So in other words, we don't want to train our children to only do things when they get manipulated or screamed at to do it. We want them to learn how to move in delegated authority. Because when mom and dad are yielded to God and we tell you to do something, you now have the authority to do that. We don't get that. Because for that child, if I say, Jimmy, go ahead and play and have a good time, I have just given Jimmy the authority to play and have a good time. If I say, Jimmy, I want you to go and pick up your room now, Jimmy now has authority to clean up his room and expect God to give him wisdom on how to do it right. And if Jimmy will learn that when he's little, he can move in the marketplace with divine authority. He can move in his family with divine authority. Oh, every day I've got to choose. I am going to yield to God's authority, and then I'm going to choose to move in it. If he can move me away from the cake, one day he can use me in authority that I can lay hands on the sick and they'll recover because I've learned how to move in that authority. Right. <clears throat> because with understanding great authority comes great faith. Faith in who? The one who I'm yielded to in his authority. Number six, and this is very important, learn to quickly recognize legitimate and illegitimate authority around you. Do you know that you're surrounded by people that are more than willing to tell you what to do? Now, they can never get it done in their lives. I had one sergeant one time tell me, he said, you know, he said, opinions are like belly buttons. Everybody has one. Some are deeper than others, and some are just full of lint. And 
everybody around you has illegitimate authority, always wants to try to pile on you the things they can't do. That was the trouble that Jesus had with the Pharisees. They made rules they couldn't even keep, but they measured the quality of the people around them by their ability to keep their rules. The commandments of God are actually very easy when you surrender to God. They're not hard. God told them that in the beginning. He said, don't think that this is impossible to do. It's easy. Not killing is easy. Not lying is easy if you surrender to truth. Not bearing false witness on a neighbor is easy if you're yielded to God. <coughs> you ready for the next one? Telling a mountain, be thou removed and be thou cast into the sea becomes easy when God says that mountain doesn't need to be there. And see, I have an attitude that if God has told me that mountain is not supposed to be there, and I say, be thou removed and be thou cast into the sea, if it decides to resist, there's always dynamite. <laughs> Why? I have been commissioned to move that mountain. I can speak to it, or I can grab it rock by rock and throw it into the sea. But one way or the other that mountain is coming down because I've been given authority to bring it down. You see, sometimes God wants to give you a miracle and sometimes the miracle is just a supernatural instantaneous manifestation of that mountain moving and sometimes he said, I want you to march, or march around those walls for seven days and on that seventh day I want you to go around it seven times and I don't want you to grab your shofar and I want you to blow it like you've never blown it. Now once you've done all the things I've told you to do and that's an end to what I have told you to do, then I'm going to go ahead and do what I told you I'm going to do. But what we would rather do is, Lord, it's hot today. You know how big that city is? Lord, I'm a fat boy. You know, now, can I just commission Pastor Rodhouse to do it? I want to delegate it. It's your wall. You go walk around it. And by that seventh day, you better have enough tenacity to walk around it seven times. Could you imagine, Brother Chuck, God saying, uh, uh, this is, no, this is, because they actually did on the Sabbath, they did on Passover, which is really kind of cruel. But, God's calling us now. We're going we're to congregate out here by I-44, and we're going to walk the circumference of the city limits of Marshfield seven times today. Get up pretty early. Pretty early. <laughs> the dusk when you get done, and God says, now grab your shofar and toot it. Watch me work. And then, after, then they actually had to go into the battle after that. Obedience, and this is what we don't realize. I mean, that, that Jericho wasn't a small place. Okay. Obedience to the to God and yielding to that authority gave them supernatural strength not only to walk it seven times in that day, but after they walked it seven times and blowed the shofar and the walls came down, they had to fight. Yeah. And they had supernatural strength to fight because they were yielded to authority. Yielding to godly authority is the key to supernatural strength. It's also the ability to look at illegitimate authority and say, no. No. And in the way that everything is right now in America, you had better learn how to move in godly authority because you may have to, and there's times God's going to not tell you run from illegitimate authority. You square your shoulders back, you look it in the eyes, and you say, you are illegitimate, and God says, no. Come on. We do that any time you cast out a devil. You do that any time you pray over the sick. But how I many know when, when the guy over there, because illegitimate authority will first start out with power, they got guns, you got God. How I many know it's really not a battle? If God told you, go do this, and you yield to the authority, his authority, that makes all the difference. Now, 
We're going to get more into understanding biblical authority next week. But this is, if, if you don't respect and understand authority, you're never going to get anywhere. And I have seen too many in the charismatic movement get hyped up on authority juice. Go, go authority juice that all they've been told is how the devil's got to do everything that they say and they've never been taught how to submit to be a man under authority and they get their lunches eat. Not here. I want you in the place, I want you completely yielded to God. That's... That's what all this is about. Uh, if, if I can't get this, I might as well just go home, guys. I want you completely living for God, living this word, and quit paying attention to all the hype that's out there and just go with God's word. God's requiring you to come under his authority. God's requiring you to move in his authority. God's requiring you to be a doer of the word and not a hearer only because in the doing, you have power released in your life. That's what I want for you guys. I want you guys to not need me except to coach you. Completely different than the way most religious systems are, aren't they? It's to get you dependent upon the church. Well, since you are the church, how about being dependent upon yourself and God? And then when you get in a situation to where you've not learned to move in that authority yet or your faith is, then, then we can come uh, together and fight this thing with you because we've all learned how to move in authority. But we've not done that. What we've done is we, we, we've hoped, you know, the word says if two or three are gathered in his name that we'll have whatever we ask, those two or three know, have been yielded to his authority and know how to move in authority. But what we do is we try to gang up 100 unbelievers and try to gang up against the devil and the prayer doesn't get answered and we blame God. All it takes is a couple completely yielded to him. He says, you can get that, you can get the job done. One can put 1,000 to flight, two can put 10,000 to flight, three can put 100,000 to flight, four can put a million to flight. Exponential annotation when they learn how to flow in God and they're completely surrendered to Him. That's what I'm after. In every area of life, I want to see you guys blessed. I want to see divine order brought into your households. I want to see your kids not only learning to yield to authority, but as they grow up mature to learn how to move in authority. That's when they can bring peace on the playground. You're not going to bully Jimmy anymore. How many know a bully hates real authority and will cower down to it pretty quick? Well, Father, we thank you that we are a people and that we're becoming a people that have made you Lord and that we recognize the authority of heaven this morning. And Father, as a people, we surrender to your throne. We surrender to the completed work of Jesus on the cross. We surrender to that blood that has forgiven every sin. We surrender to that blood covenant. We surrender to your word. And Father, we're no longer going to argue with your throne. We're not going to argue with that blood. We're not going to argue with that word. But Father, we're going to be practitioners of what heaven has commanded. Father, we just ask that your spirit would loose a new anointing within us to teach us, to tutor us day in and day out how to yield to your authority and how to move in that delegated authority to change things here on the earth. And Father, we're believing that your Spirit's going to correct us, he's going to encourage us, and he's going to instruct us. And Father, we thank you, and we praise you for it this morning in Jesus' name. 